This is a bad idea. Oh! Morning, viewers. That was a terrible idea. In today's long-awaited episode, especially by me, I don't know if by you too, we're going to talk about giant bugs. Yes, exactly. The time has finally come for me to present to you something I've been waiting for a very long time. For a long time I couldn't find these bugs, I mean bugs, insects. And finally the opportunity came up, so now I have them, and now I'll tell you something about them. But first, a little announcement. Two new clothing designs inspired by spiders are now available in my store. And since many of you have asked me if you can buy a spider from me, there's now a new section with live spiders, arachnids and insects. And from now on you can officially buy live spiders in my store. The area is home to a variety of interesting species including eraser spiders, jumping spiders, whip spiders, centipedes, scorpions and much more. I'm leaving the store links for you in the description below the video and now let's get back to the beetles. Let's start with the fact that literally two years ago I also showed you huge horned beetles. However, those were Goliathus goliathus, the renowned goliath beetle, believed to be the world's heaviest beetle. And those are beetles from central tropical Africa, so we took a journey through Africa. Then it was time for the equally famous Hercules beetles, which are very close cousins of the main stars of today's episode. And this time we visited South America because that's where uh, uh, among other places in Ecuador, Hercules beetles live, which are considered by many to be the largest and longest beetles in the world. However, today we won't be visiting Africa, we won't be visiting South America, today we're flying to Asia. And I mean specifically Indonesia, where we can actually see these wonders live, sometimes in huge numbers. Let's begin. First, I'll show you what I need today. I'll need four boxes, because basically I have everything here that I should have. Hey, 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 don't run away, you crazy guy. Yes, we have two big boxes with two very unruly beetles inside, especially one that's acting up here and is about to start flying. And of course we have two smaller boxes, one of which has a female, and in the other one there is... You'll see in a moment, company, these are today's main characters. So we have one, two, where's the third? Kaji the beetle, unless I mixed up the boxes, which of course I did. Three! We have three beetles, cool. And besides these fantastic animals, which really, really like to walk around... Oh, sit here. Okay, I know. Uh, we also have a fresh orange, because they need to eat something. And then we'll feed them and change their food. And these are the culprits behind all the commotion. At the same time, they are some of the most amazing, most beautiful, and probably the hardest to obtain beetles I've had the chance to breed in my career. And what is this? My dear friends, both this specimen and that specimen, as well as that female and the larva you had a chance to see in the cutscenes, all belong to one and the same genus, and that is the genus Halcosoma. Chalcosoma is a genus of beetles that we can safely call rhinoceros beetles, because they belong to the subfamily Dynastinae within the family Scarabaidae. So in quotation marks you could say they are scarab beetles, but I prefer to use the name rhinoceros beetles because that name has become associated with these horned creatures. Sorry about the sound of the cricket, but I was feeding Leosia, and apparently she missed one, so it's chirping. And as you already know, these are beetles that naturally occur in tropical forests and on oil palm plantations in Southeast Asia, including Indonesia. And we'll focus on Indonesia here, because that's where both of these species come from. Exactly, species. The entire Calcosoma genus isn't very rich in species, as it has only five of them, with the second to last described in 2004 and the last one ten years later in 2014. These are quite rare species, not very well known and practically unavailable in breeding, at least I've never seen an offer even for larvae. So we'll focus on the three most popular species, two of which I have myself. And these are Chalcosoma molencampi, which interestingly is a species found only on Borneo, and Chalcosoma atlas, which is probably the most popular species of the entire genus. This species can be found in Indonesia, for example. There is a third largest species of the genus, which I unfortunately don't have alive, only as specimens, and which used to be called Halcosoma caucasus, but now that's an obsolete synonym, and its current name is Halcosoma hyron. These beetles grow up to about 13 centimeters in length when it comes to males. And these are real giants in the world of rhinoceros beetles, much bigger than Halcosoma molencampi and Atlas. However, when it comes to these two species, they're cool because they have a pretty big and significant difference in the arrangement of their horns, which makes them very easy to tell apart. Uh, as you can see, Halcosoma molencampi has a sort of narrowing between the pronotum and uh, the widest part where the horns are, while Halcosoma atlas doesn't have that narrowing, and in general its horns are positioned a bit differently. 
Someone might ask, what do they need those horns for? Well, the answer here is pretty obvious because since only the males have horns, it's a sign. Oh, 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 okay. That was a really bad idea. Ow, that was a tight squeeze. Yeah, we don't do that with these beetles because that's, uh, they have a lot of strength. Why do they need those horns? My friends, only the males have horns, so it's pretty obvious that since nature is brutal and all, they're going to use those horns to fight for females. And that's why if we have these beetles, we absolutely never put two males in the same container because I'll show you in a moment what happens. And I'm about to show you something we, we generally avoid when breeding beetles. I'm very much against these insect fights, which are quite common, especially in Asia. But look how little it takes for males, even of two different species, to start fighting. All right, all right, all right, all right, all right, all right. See? That's exactly the point. That's why we can't put two males next to each other, because there will be a fight. So now you know why males have horns. Asking why females have horns is the wrong question, because females don't have horns. In the whole subfamily of Dynastenae, well, maybe not the whole subfamily, but in the vast majority of species, there is a huge sexual dimorphism, where the males are usually bigger, armed with all kinds of horns, and there can be three horns, two horns, one horn, or even five horns. This really happens in all sorts of configurations, while the females look like typical beetles, meaning they simply don't have these horns. They're often much more wrinkled, uh, while here, as you can see, the males are smooth. Even the generic scientific name, Halcosoma, comes from the Greek word Halkos, which means copper, so these are simply copper beetles. And another thing is, um, I don't know who in Poland might have such adult beetles for sale, for example, right? I got these from Prague, where they occasionally appear as imports. These beetles weren't bred, but caught in their natural habitat and brought to Europe. And that's phenomenal, because people pay big money for these beetles in Europe, while in places where they occur naturally, like in Indonesia, in some cases they're even considered pests. And to confirm what I'm saying, I'll cite a scientific paper that describes how large populations can occur on oil palm plantations. Because that's their natural habitat. Adult beetles enjoy feeding on the fruit of these palms, which is why they are attracted to them. And this paper shows that over the course of six months of research, special traps that were adapted to catch these beetles, since they're pests, they just catch them there, caught 650,000 individuals of Halcosoma atlas in six months. In this case, this little guy, I know, don't get upset anymore. Do you understand that? 650,000, well over half a million individuals on a single plantation. That's an enormous number. So despite their rarity in Europe where they do occur, they're simply common. Uh, and here, probably the least common is this Halcosoma molencampi, because as I said, it only occurs in Borneo and therefore has a somewhat limited range. Halcosom Atlas and Chiron have much larger ranges. And now, after publishing the reels with these beetles, a lot of people have asked whether they are in any way dangerous to humans. Generally, the answer is no. They are not venomous or poisonous, and they can't bite us. However, these beetles are absurdly strong. Many times in children's books about different animals, you've heard that, you know, Hercules beetles were named Hercules because they can lift up to 750 times their own weight. And basically, the whole subfamily Dynastinae, which includes rhinoceros beetles, consists of beetles with absurd strength, and you just saw a demonstration of that strength when it boldly pinched my finger. I mean, I put my finger where I shouldn't have, and you really shouldn't put your finger between the pronotum and the head, because right in the middle they have this tiny horn, and when they squeeze it, it hurts. It really does hurt, even if it didn't break the skin. We don't do things like that. Similarly, if you have these kinds of beetles, don't put your fingers between the pronotum and the elytra, which are the hardened second pair of wings in beetles, because there's a gap here, and when they clamp down... Ouch. Ouch, exactly. That will be ouch, and it can work a bit like a nail clipper. These little animals are generally great, but you have to be careful with them, because they can accidentally clip your nails. Especially if you stick your finger where you shouldn't, for example here. Ow, ow. Oh, and the nail is cut off. Because since they have such sharp plates here, they can really cut off a nail with just a move like this. Other than that, they're generally harmless. The main thing is not to stick your finger in here, so basically don't do what I'm doing right now. Because if we stick our finger in and it lifts its head up, then I'll have a bit of a problem and it's going to be quite painful since the whole shell is very hard. 
They have so much chitin and so many hardeners packed in here that they're practically indestructible and extremely well armored. And this uh, chitinization also means that during fights, when two males are battling, these fights usually don't end with the death of either male, maybe just some minor injuries, but more often with one being knocked off a branch or dropped from a height. And now regarding these fights, I have an interesting fact to share. My dear friends, this specimen and this one too are, I'd say, fairly small males. In certain species, they can grow much larger, and Halcosoma molencampi can easily reach this size, so there are simply individuals that are bigger than this one. And the law of nature works in such a way that the bigger male usually wins. Uh, well, if we have a plantation of oil palms, those huge males roam there, and their goal is to mate with as many females as possible, because they're the biggest, they're like, you know, macho, and generally in most fights they just win against the smaller males, who therefore have smaller horns and are overall weaker, and so on. And in the case of these beetles, the small males have it tough in life because they practically won't be able to get to the females, since the bigger male will always beat them. Um, so the small males of these species have figured out a certain tactic, specifically the so-called stealth tactic, which means that while the bigger males are busy fighting, the small males just sneak up to the females and, you know, do what they do with them. And what's really amazing is that in these species, the size of the male doesn't actually affect the size of his genitals. Do you get that? There can be a tiny male, and he's just as capable of functioning and can mate with the female, just like the bigger males. So that's pretty interesting among these beetles, and as you can see, he likes to walk around. The next question that may arise is whether these beetles can fly. Just like the goliaths, they can indeed take off and fly in the same manner. Just like probably all beetles from this subfamily, they can fly. This one probably won't show us any acrobatics today, but sometimes in the evening they do fly around a bit, and yes, they're definitely capable of flight. The flight is very loud and quite spectacular, but they don't use this ability very often. Definitely more often in their natural environment, I'm absolutely sure of that. Oh, and one more thing about being dangerous. So, they're absolutely not dangerous, they won't bite us. However, if we have such large beetles around, we need to keep in mind that they have very long and very strong claws at the ends of each of their six legs, and if we try to detach such a beetle, it can turn out to be a bit painful. But besides that, they're beautiful, they're charming, I have an idea what to do, I have an idea. Listen, we'll take a pencil and boldly stick it between those horns. Let's see if it destroys the pencil. Oh, okay, so it didn't destroy it, but there's a solid dent, so I could probably do the same with my finger. So, once again, uh, these beetles are really strong, so you just have to be careful with those horns, so you don't end up with a punctured finger. And finally, I'll show you how to feed these beetles. Because it's very simple. While the larvae eat decayed wood, adult beetles eat fruit, and you can feed them bananas, oranges, other fruits, or special jellies that are available in terrarium stores. All right, my friends, let's try to do this with one hand. Maybe it'll work. Now, as for this, we're not going there because you'll fall, and then what? It'll be a mess. When it comes to feeding, well, it's pretty simple because we can just give them fruit. So we take a piece of fruit that's already been eaten, take it out, and give them an orange. And now we won't feed him over there at all, just let him munch on this orange here. Now, I see there's zero cooperation when it comes to you. Oh, he already got it. Or maybe not. Sir, I want to give you something to eat. This one is very naughty. We'll give him an orange inside, and maybe then he'll want to eat a bit of it for us. Oh, it looks like the second one liked it because he latched on and doesn't want to let go. Well, so taking care of them is basically very simple. Quite a high temperature, lots of humidity, and you can keep such beetles without any problem. Ow, ow, you really messed up my shirt, man. Jesus, now I'll have to wash it. We're saying goodbye to these little guys. Thank you so much for watching. If you're interested in the world of beetles, I'll try to get some other types and species of rhinoceros beetles and show them all to you here. See you in the next video. Bye!